When I think of classic Amiga and PC platform games, I inevitably end up remembering Fire and Ice, the daring adventures of Cool Coyote. It's known to a wider audience in Europe, I would say, since it was a superb game for the Amiga. But here in the US, I played the crap out of the MS-DOS PC version. This copy is still sealed, but I owned a shareware disc back then and beat it over and over. And then a friend got the full version and I never got to play it. But now I'm a loser with money, so I went out and bought a boxed Amiga version to play on my Amiga 500, and I never looked back. The best platformer since Rainbow Islands. That's a bold statement. I always found this odd since I never saw much of a fair comparison between the gameplay of Rainbow Islands and Fire and Ice, but I suppose they're both platformers and they're awesome, and the same designer, Andrew Braybrook, was involved in ports of both. Whatever, marketing. Inside you get some discs, a freaking awesome poster, and a manual with all sorts of information, including a rather lengthy but forgettable backstory involving evil forces taking over the world and Cool Coyote being chosen to save the day. You also get a copy protection sheet, which is 100% required to play the game in its uncracked original form. It's worth noting that this game does not play on an American NTSC Amiga, at least on the machines that I've tried it on, but on my PAL machine here it works just fine. The game starts off with some nice graphics and a cool animated scene of Cool Coyote playing the piano, barking along to the theme song. Pretty memorable theme song too, whether you like it or not, it will get stuck in your head. Nice and upbeat, and really sets the tone for the rest of the game to come. In Fire and Ice, a coyote is you. Cool coyote, to be exact. Because he's awesome. And because he is literally cool, with the ability to shoot balls of ice from his mouth. Balls of ice. <laughs> no, okay, I'm kidding. This is your primary defense against the bestiary of the game, which changes from level to level. The thing that separates Fire and Ice from other platform games is the key mechanic. You'll have to freeze enemies and shatter their remains, and there's a chance that they will be holding a key fragment. But you'll need to do so quickly because they'll soon thaw, becoming more resistant to your attacks. And you die instantly if you're touched by something deadly, so you really need to be careful breaking enemies. Break enough enemies, get enough key parts, and then go towards the end of the level to unlock the keyhole which will turn into a door. You can also gain power-up weapons, which last for a limited time. These are often contained in hidden ice cubes which are revealed when shot. You'll get things like a spread shot, ice grenades, and several other goodies which have a limited amount of ammo and are activated by holding fire. This can be odd, since you'll often accidentally use a special weapon by holding the button too long or pressing it too fast in succession. It's made even more awkward since there's no dedicated button for jumping, instead having to press up to jump. I found that playing this game with a joystick was a real pain, so playing with a Genesis controller was awesome, and the keyboard isn't too bad on the PC version. Occasionally you will run into low-flying midget clouds. These can be shot and frozen, producing snowflakes which can be used as screen-clearing bombs by crouching and firing. But watch out for the cloud getting too dark as it will start to shoot lightning and that's never fun. The final main game mechanic is the puppy, sometimes referred to as pouch. This little guy doesn't look very much like you, and actually I think his sprite is left over from when the game featured a doofy looking dog instead of cool coyote, but whatever. He serves three purposes. To act as a secondary fire, since it will shoot whenever you do. To act as an extra life, if you can get him to follow you through the keyhole at the end of the level. And to act as an annoyance, since getting him there is an aggravation and a half. The little dude just acts bizarrely, jumping around at various speeds, sometimes not following you across platforms, and getting stuck off screen, so you'll need to keep him inside at all times for him to follow you. But I guess since the little guy is pretty much a walking, barking extra life, he needs to be a pain. Otherwise, you'd be getting extra lives really easily. And the only other way you'll be grabbing extra lives in each level is the occasional giant blue dog bone. Since you die after one hit, obviously lives are a huge necessity, so you'll need to keep those little puppies following you around, but of course this is a pain because of all the enemies, and although there's no timer shown, each level has a time limit. And this is really creepy, even to this day for me. The time of day changes several times in each level, and eventually the time will stop and this thing will appear, chasing after you until it touches you and ruthlessly murders you. You'll notice the map across the bottom of the screen, 
Well, instead of doing something useful like showing the current levels map, it shows you how far along you are in the whole game. It looks nice, and it's nicely animated, sure, but it is kind of pointless. It pretty much just shows you what you already know, that each level is going to look slightly different. There are several levels in each world, each requiring you to do the same enemy-freezing, key-collecting, puppy-thieving routine over and over again, with the boss at the end of each world. Thankfully, I never got bored of any of the game's environments, because even as the level's themes in each world are the same, there is always some new environmental puzzle to get through, or some small variation on the look of things or the enemies that keep things interesting. The problem is, it's just frickin' hard. I may have had patience to get through this as a kid, and yeah, I did, several times, but now? No, and there's no way I'm touching this game without a trainer. Call me a pansy, I don't care. It's not a long game, and in fact, it's only about 45 minutes if you just grind through it, but there's no way you're just going to get through the whole game in that amount of time without cheating or being incredibly Jedi-like in your actions. The combination of slightly floaty controls and deadly enemy and trap placement is simply put evil. You really need to take your time and learn these levels and enemies to survive, otherwise you're not making it past Scotland. I'd love to just show the rest of the levels and the cool stuff that you'll find in each of them because there's some truly memorable stuff here, including several hidden and warp areas, but that would turn into more of a long play than a review, and uh, those are already on YouTube. But I just have to mention the jungle world because of how good it looks, the floating islands world where you simply collect presents kind of as a bonus, and the underwater world because, well dang it, I love underwater worlds, and this one is spectacular. Plus it has some of the coolest underwater music that I've heard apart from Donkey Kong Country. I'd also really love to show the ending of the game because it's one of the coolest, most pleasant, and absurdly trippy endings I've ever seen, but seriously, it's worth playing through and finding it for yourself. Or just look up a playthrough online if you really want to spoil it. Fire and Ice has its share of annoyances, but it doesn't matter. The gameplay is unique, varied, and solid. The controls are a bit bizarre at first, but you get used to them, and although you'll be cursing them a few levels in, I don't think it's any fault of the controls. It's just that the game is meant to be stupidly challenging, like so many old-school platform games, and you can't fault it for that. It's the arcade difficulty seeping into home games yet again. But the payoff is worth it, due to the fun gameplay and the cool stuff you'll see and experience, and this is especially true of the Amiga version. Now, I've been showing the OCS version on this video, but I'd also like to mention the PC version, since that's the one I played as a kid. In comparison, it's pretty lackluster, since it utilizes a low-color VGA mode and simplistic sound blaster effects and music, although if you have a Roland MT-32, you have that as an option. But the solid gameplay is there. You also get a nifty little jukebox feature in the drop-down menu, as well as a training mode, the ability to save and load your game, and the ability to change the game's speed. And minus the map at the bottom of the screen, it seems to have all the elements of the Amiga version. So while some technicalities might be a little lesser than the Amiga, it has some extra features which really make it worth a look. The Atari ST version kind of sucks though, with slower gameplay and choppier frame rates on top of the lower quality graphics and sound. That, and I couldn't get the Genesis controller to work with it. There's also a version for the Acorn Archimedes, which I've never seen, and the rare Master System version from Brazil. This one was developed for the European market, but it was cancelled, and then released in Brazil where the Master System was still thriving. There are also the Amiga AGA and Amiga CD32 versions. The CD32 version in particular may just be the best version out there, although I haven't actually played it on the CD32. Playing in WinUAE, you can notice the incredible graphics in the background and a CD audio soundtrack. And that's Fire and Ice. If you're wanting some classic and enjoyable platform fun with awesome everything, then check it out. It may be tough as nails about halfway through, but it's all good if you just keep your cool, and who knows, you might end up like me and consider it one of the best platform games of the time.